Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Research America Alliance discussion. So my name is Sophia Casca, and I would like to thank you for joining on Zoom today and for your partnership in the Research America Alliance. If your organization is not a member, I hope that you'll shoot an email to Joel, our director of membership, whose email is in the chat, to discuss the alliance. So today we are joined by Dr. Josh Denny, Chief Executive Officer of the All of Us Research Program. Dr. Denny will discuss the work of the All of Us Research Program, including uh, their efforts to build a diverse database that can inform thousands of studies on a variety of health conditions. So as always, please type your questions into the Q&A box or in chat. Any questions we don't get to, we'll try to get to them at the end. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. So let's start with um, just our first question. So Dr. Denny, can you start by telling us a bit more about the All of Us Research Program and you know, how will 1 million participants contribute to um, precision medicine? Well, first, thank you so much, Sophia, for having me on. It's a real pleasure to be here and speak with all of you here. I look forward to your questions that come. Um, uh, it's a real great pleasure to talk about the All of Us Research Program. It began as the Precision Medicine Initiative Cohort Program. It's not a name that rolls off the tongue. Um, in 2015, um, as part of the larger announcement of a Precision Medicine Initiative, and we began building a program in 2016, and we launched nationally in 2018 with the mission to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs to enable individualized, pre individualized prevention, treatment, and care for all of us. And our goal is to reach at least a million diverse participants. We want to nurture longitudinal relationships with participants across the country who partner with us to make healthcare better for everyone. And then we want to take their trust that we get from our participants and sharing their data and deliver it, their data into as many researchers' hands safely and securely as we can, maintaining trust and really have an ecosystem of researchers, uh, funders, and communities that help support this program to really become an indispensable part of research into the future. I want, um, as we think about, uh, as, as a provider myself, thinking about using things like Framingham risk scores to think about cardiovascular risk in my patients. I want to imagine there's a future in which we know healthcare has been made different for all populations in the future because of the All of Us Research Program. And we've really made tremendous progress already. We have more than three quarters of a million participants that have consented in our program uh, in just, you know, Six, six years since we nationally launched, and more than 550,000 have donated biospecimens. We also get electronic health records. We have surveys that people answer. People answer surveys on an ongoing basis with us, um, provide new information, and they also do other kinds of cognitive tasks and brain games are one of the things we have now where, where people um, uh, can do different things and tell what's a city or a mountain and how fast it is and things like this that give you cognitive traits on behavioral and mental health. And then um, uh, we collect biospecimens, an important part of that as well. And then people do things like donate Fitbit data. And we're really a multimodal study that's lasting, uh, we intend, for decades. Um, uh, and uh, to be many decades from now, uh, we intend for this program, maybe the children of the current participants are even part of the program um, as we think about making an impact on health. Oh my goodness, this sounds fabulous. And it's so great to hear how much it's grown already in the six years that um, it has been um, around. Um, so could you actually tell us a little bit um, more about the data? As a scientist myself, how are the data from this project available to scientists? And um, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the projects that um, are going on that are already using this data? Certainly. Uh, you know, we begin with collecting and engaging our participants. And, you know, I think the power of the data is through, of course, the participants who have joined us. And uh, I talked a lot about the, I told you something about the numbers, but it's really important the diversity of the participants, because that's what's really empowering research. Um, nearly 50% of them are diverse by race and ethnicity, but that's just one part of diversity. We think of, uh, if you look at the literature, uh, many different populations are underrepresented in biomedical research. It includes access to healthcare, 
rural populations, sexual and gender minorities, people with disabilities. You know, we have really sought to be inclusive with our partnership with participants and then building this data set. Mm -hmm. And then we have made the data set available to researchers through a cloud-based passport access model. What does that mean? That means researchers come to the data instead of having to download the data and work in their environments. That simultaneously makes it both faster um, and cheaper and safer um, uh, to use the data. And so that means uh, since we first uh, launched and to available to researchers, we um, have over 9,000 researchers using the data. We um, uh, just started uh, allowing international researchers to use the data at the end of last year. Um, and we already have uh, researchers on six continents using the data outside of the US, um, including low and medium income countries. We think um, uh, it's a real power to do this. And just to give you an example, we just released um, uh, last year, uh, 245,000 whole genomes, um, uh, which is at the time was the largest release of genome sequences uh, in the world. And it is incredibly diverse. So if you look at all the genome-wide association studies that have ever been done, about 90% of them involve people of European ancestry. Our data are about 50%, you know, not European ancestry. And so that really diversifies the kind of uh, genome set that people can work with. And as a result of that, uh, you know, we see a billion variants that we've observed in our population. So about a third of the genome. And amongst those uh, 275 million variants were not even recorded in dbSNP, um, uh, not to mention any resource that has phenotypic data on the patients. So, you know, we know things about disease status and things like that with our patients. They're with us longitudinally. We have up to 40 years of electronic health record data on these participants. So you really get to look at them over time. And so these 9,000 researchers, um, more than 700 sites, they're doing some really cool projects across this. And um, uh, we really see uh, publications picking up um, at this point. Um, and um, uh, you know, one thing I'll highlight is because uh, diverse researchers are so important in the, in the process um, uh, and also at all stages. Um, I'll give you one story of a researcher, um, uh, and I know we're going to be talking about more, but I'm going to start with one. And this one is a, um, a, a post back student, so just finished undergrad, who came into my lab. And, uh, and he, um, uh, he was looking for a project. Um, his undergrad uh, did not focus on genetics or computer science. And I said, you know, 12 years ago, I did a project looking at genome-wide associations for hypothyroidism. Common disease, 12% of people over 65 um, used to be quite deadly. Now we have great treatments for it. Um, uh, and, and I said, go take this paper. There's been no diverse, in 12 years since I did this study, there's been no diverse uh, genome-wide association studies done on this. Can you go do this? And so he, you know, got onto the platform, figured out how to do it, uh, figured out how to find these participants um, and uh, figured out what a GWASP was, never heard of this before, um, and, and, and what hypothyroidism was. He wasn't familiar with that either um, and gave me my first, uh, his first Manhattan plot in six weeks. It took me, when I did it, two and a half years, 40 people, you know, probably, we probably spent millions of dollars or so doing this study. You know, he did it in six weeks with undergrad for $30. So, so you know, it's, um, it really shows how we've been able to accelerate research, I think, um, and, and put, you know, democratize access across uh, different researchers. That's really fantastic to hear and such a wonderful story, too. Um, so speaking about the researchers themselves, you know, for, for us reaching diverse researcher audiences is really important. Um, and from what I understand, it's also important to the All of Us program, too. So how, how are you ensuring that you're reaching a, a diversity of researchers who are currently working in the biomedical space? You know, we believe that if you have more diverse researchers, you'll do better science. You'll get more diversity of the questions you ask. Um, and uh, I think we can actually play a role in building up the biomedical workforce by enabling the kind of power and access to this kind of community. And it's important to our participants. Our participants want to see researchers from their communities using the data. So um, we have more than 700 institutions that have access to the resource now. Uh, many of these, uh, we have deliberately focused on creating on-ramps for minority-serving institutions, 
uh, historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions. Um, we have some awards we just made to uh, help support tribal colleges and universities um, uh, and, and indigenous researchers to come on as well. And uh, about 40% of our researchers are, um, uh, are diverse by race and ethnicity, uh, which includes any race or ethnicity other than um, non-Hispanic white and Asian. So we actually, ex we exclude both of those um, components from that. Um, uh, metric uh, of 40%. And we really think about stage of uh, researcher as well um, in that. And we've created programs to help people on board mm -hmm. to um, have uh, very regular uh, on ramps and uh, sessions where they can call up and talk about their problems um, and using the data and get help uh, in the process. A lot of online training and um, tools that they can use and notebooks they can copy to uh, analyze the data. And one thing, you know, beyond just the typical researchers, patient advocacy groups has been part of this. When we first launched um, uh, and first took a look at the data, our number one user at the time, this was back in I don't know, maybe the summer of 2020, was actually from a uh, patient advocacy group. It wasn't your classic mm -hmm. R1 institution. Um, uh, it was um, uh, research being done on autoimmune conditions um, from a nonprofit. Um, and I just found that, you know, exactly the kind of story that we wanted. Um, uh, we of course have all sorts of different kinds of institutions as involved and researchers. Um, and I really wanna engage the community richly uh, in this. And you see that in the questions they're asking. We have dis um, studies really looking across the board of different kinds of conditions and diseases and healthcare access, many different things like that. That's fantastic. That's so great to hear. Um, I want to circle back to just to, just for a second to talk about the diversity of the samples that you have um, already um, in the program. So um, how exactly um, will this project achieve the, the diversity in the sample population that you're hoping to get um, that's actually necessary for sufficient statistical power for analyses? related to things like race and ethnicity, and you know, particularly connecting to those who are historically underserved or in historically underserved communities um, who are concerned about their personal information being used in research? Oh, great questions. It is really important that we connect with diverse audiences. And it's really through a nationwide network uh, on of community partners and participant advocacy groups um, that carry the messages to our participants. So uh, groups like the National Alliance for Hispanic Health, Asian Health Coalition, uh, 50 Forward, working with um, older individuals, uh, the Black Greek Letter Consortium, um, uh, which is the historically Black um, uh, sororities, uh, together reaching out to their participants and, um, and their members and, and conveying trust and communicating um, with these. And we have more than 100 of these partners that are engaged uh, nationally or locally. And even beyond that, our um, academic medical centers and other regional medical centers, our federally qualified health centers, all these different kinds of groups that are in neighborhoods and, and working with local organizations to get that message out and convey that trust. And then it's our responsibility to make sure we protect the data and secure it. We obviously uh, remove all you know, clear identifiers in research data sets. Um, uh, our participants are partners with us. We do stay in touch with them. We, we, you know, this isn't a throw over the fence kind of study. We can get back in contact with you. We do know who our participants are, but we're a firewall between the researchers uh, who get de-identified data and, you know, the participants that we know who they are and, we, and who we can recontact. And so having the, um, our, our partners with us, our engagement partners that are help have helped us build the resource, have been involved in governance um, uh, and advising us in the program every step of the way, um, uh, have really been critical. They're in all our governing bodies. Um, we have participants uh, in all our governing bodies as well to um, uh, really give and give us feedback and help us navigate this process. So we hear their voice frequently. That's fantastic. Um, I'd like to ask, so, what would you say sets all of us apart um, as a cohort study and why should people enroll as participants? So all of us is really distinct in several ways. One of course is its focus on diversity and, and partnering with participants. But one of the things that's built off of that is, is our return of, a focus on return of value. Now, the number one reason we hear from participants why they join 
is um, around uh, making science better for their communities and the altruism of contributing to better health, a better, better healthy future um, for uh, the country and their communities. But beyond that, we know that we can provide value to our participants as well. And uh, the, one of the biggest ways we do, have done that and, and heard from them that they want us to do that is on genomics. So um, uh, we are doing uh, genomic health related return of results. We also do some other things like genetic ancestry and non-health related traits, you know, whether you can taste cilantro and things like that. But a big focus for us has been on genomic health results. And we launched that a little over a year ago. It includes um, uh, 59 genes that have very dramatic uh, impacts on health that you can do something about if you have it. So things like breast and um, ovarian cancer syndrome genes, BRCA1, BRCA2, uh, genes around Lynch syndrome and, and uh, colon cancer uh, and other cancer risk, um, hereditary cardiomyopathies and, uh, and hereditary arrhythmias, which you know can present um, sometimes for the first time with death, um, that are all intervenable. And in this case, um, so we return these, we have genetic counselors, uh, to support this process that are native uh, speakers of English and Spanish. And we have a language line that can support 200 uh, additional languages um, to really support the communication of these results, which is about 3% of our participants, which is a small number, but that's numbers now about, you know, and we're still very, we're still kind of early. We're only a year into doing this now, but, you know, we've, we've now returned about 100,000 results. And, and so, you know, we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, more than 2,000 people that have received are receiving results like this that could have dramatic impacts on their life um, and, and really change things for them. And, and one of the other powers of these kinds of results are uh, participants are talking to providers all across the country because we have all 50 states and most US territories represented. So as they take these reports to their providers, uh, the idea of doing precision medicine, I think hopefully becomes demystified, that providers will get more comfortable to thinking about you know, how to respond to these things. Um, the other kind of thing we do in this 59 genes are pharmacogenomics. So how your DNA interacts with drugs you might take. More than 90% of those people uh, uh, that, that want results back will have an actionable variant if they are exposed to the drug. And about 20% of people actually will be exposed to a drug at some point. Um, so this is very real. It's not 3% of the population, it's, you know, a fifth of the population uh, could be on a different drug because of pharmacogenetic results from our program. And again, per these participants are taking the results to providers across the country. I think that's a impact we can have on uh, healthcare and precision medicine in general with the size of our program. So that's the biggest thing about returning value, I think, with our participants and being in contact with them, engaging this over time. This is just the beginning of the kind of stuff we'll do because we're launching ancillary studies off of our program. We have a huge one called Nutrition for Precision Health, the biggest diet study that's really been done of this sort, where people actually at some point will come into, some of these people actually come into a um, uh, clinical research center uh, and have a controlled diet randomized for um, uh, some period of time and have a bunch of measurements taken um, uh, at the most involved in. So uh, there's all sorts of things that are built off of this cohort that will be unique and not necessarily possible in other kinds of your traditional cohorts. Wow, this is amazing. It's, it sounds like it's already starting to have such a strong impact on, on the individuals who are participating. Um, so I, I wanna go a little bit more, more broadly now um, about kind of the overall impact. So can you tell us a, a bit more about the emerging scientific impact of all of us and what kind of results are you seeing so far from the program's process? Mm -hmm. So we have over, <laughs> over 300 um, uh, papers that have come out so far, and it's really accelerating. Um, uh, last week, uh, on Monday, we had five papers come out in Nature Journals, um, uh, including uh, the first large description of our DNA uh, resource, but a couple other papers, for instance, that looked at, for the first time, a way to take a polygenic risk score, which is this uh, summation of a, a bunch of different genetic variants towards risk of a common disease like heart disease, instead of looking um, for a single variant, looking for lots of them. And these can have really powerful effects. What was done in our resource uniquely was these scores are generally not that applicable to diverse populations. Um, and so by using that, they were able to diversify 
um, these scores and are actually putting them in a clinic. Um, they're actually being used in a trial right now um, uh, in a, another network um, built off, off of our cohort. Uh, another large study of diabetes with um, uh, about two and a half million people total. Um, and that study found a number of genetic variants, about um, over 600 loci that were associated with diabetes, and then were able to explore them more deeply. Um, uh, and so uh, another study that I think is, is really exciting, interestingly, uh, that came out recently was looking at um, APL1 kidney disease, which is um, of uh, about 70% of the excess kidney disease we see in African Americans in, in the US um, mm -hmm. is, asso is associated with APL1. Um, and so it's, it's specific to a given genetic ancestry. And uh, this study looked at that population and then found a genetic variant that seems to offset the risk. And so that kind of story uh, helps point to a way that might actually um, uh, suggest that this could be a drug target that could help ameliorate the risk of APOL1 mediated kidney disease uh, in a diverse population. And so that is so important because that kind of study is hard to do. There aren't really study cohorts out there that are large and accessible that enable this kind of research. Um, and all of us is, is, is enabling that kind of study. And you're seeing more and more of those kind of studies come out on different genes, different conditions, um, uh, hereditary anemias, things like that, that have very real impact on, on, on human wellness and very related to diverse populations um, we're seeing uh, come out. That's fantastic to hear. Um, I'd actually love to hear from you. What are some of the challenges that you have seen in research over these you know, last several years, and and how do you think the All of Us program has navigated them? As, you know, it's uh, the first one that comes to mind will probably be kind of mind for many people. If you think about a program from 2018 to 2024, so right in the, the big middle part of that with COVID, um, well, it was huge. Uh, you know, when when COVID hit, more than 99% of our participants came through, you know, personal in you know uh, contact and and we didn't have any way to reach people if it wasn't you know, almost face to face um and so you know during covid we created the capabilities of how to reach people more uh, virtually uh how to actually get biospecimens from people with a much larger network and and bolstered those capabilities um, and so that was actually much beneficial far beyond covid because mm -hmm. Now we can truly get to anyone anywhere in the United States um, because we can send a saliva kit to you. We have a national network with Quest um, uh, of 2,200 locations across the country and a number of other partners that have helped, you know, kind of fill in some of those gaps um, as well as getting the message out more digitally as well. Um, so more digital outreach um, as a component of that. And that's helped us reach rural populations where which we weren't doing very well um, before that um, and other, and populations that have a harder time traveling with have disabilities and such have a harder time getting into a medical center. Now we can send something to their home. We can even actually send a person to their home as well. Um, uh, Cause we contracted with one of the insurance company, physical, mm -hmm. one of the insurance physical uh, companies um, to do that on a more uh, limited basis um, in, uh, in certain geographies. So, um, so that's one way we tackled there and just reaching diverse populations well was obviously the first challenge. Um, and we'd already talked some about that. Over time, you know, we have seen challenges in this country too with, with uh, reminders of systemic racism and things like this that call into question again, um, things like trust with our participants and, 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 and require us to communicate and be authentic. Um, uh, I like the phrase that science moves at the speed of trust. And I think that that is an important one as we think about how we build relationships with communities and realizing these communities are different. Um, uh, each of us come with a background, a personal story, a family story, a cultural story. And we need to think about how we engage uh, uh, authentically with people based on their life experience um, and, um, uh, and those factors. So uh, I think that's a really part of it. And then the final thing I'll say is, is maybe um, maybe expected, maybe not. We focus on these issues we've talked about now, but data. We, you know, uh, uh, when we started this program, people said it would be impossible, honestly, to, you know, pull together all these different healthcare systems data, 
put them in one place, harmonize them, all the different EHR vendors, um, uh, the scale of, uh, of a million genomes um, and how to do the compute, even the data store. Um, you know, we are consistently, I think, uh, accomplishing and learning and then trying to uh, contribute back to the community and tackling big problems helps you come up with big solutions, which are, you know, um, relevant to lots of people um, and lots of communities. And so, you know, it isn't such a surprise now to think about the idea of harmonizing electronic health records. We were even one of the first real big use cases promoting the idea of patient portal linkage that you as a provider, sorry, you as a patient or I as a patient um, can go in and get their electronic health record in a standardized format by linkage to the website and pull it in. And so we even work, we're working with all um, the Office of the National Coordinator um, and different developments in the process of what some of these standards would be, what they would look like um, and promoting those use as well as lots of other ways to get electronic health records. So that would be the last one that I like. These are fantastic to hear about. I have one last question for you before we turn it over to your um, questions for the audience. So in addition to being the CEO of all of us, you also run your own lab at the National Human Genome Research Institute. So what have you been working on in your lab? And can you tell us a little bit about the research that um, your lab is doing? Thank you for that question. It's fun to talk about the other hat I get to wear and the privilege of having a research lab also. So um, uh, I my, my research uh, history was around use of electronic health records, um, especially looking at them across with uh, genomic data. And so we've developed some methods um, uh, in that approach and then applied them. And our, our methods um, are, you know, start with the observation that electronic health records uh, capture a a whole host of life experience with disease, medication exposures, uh, lab values, things like that. And so um, it provides a phenome, just like we have a genome, that is you know, not what you look for, but what a participant or patient experience. And so um, doing phenome-wide association studies across the human disease phenome um, is something that we've uh, really worked on for the last um, 15 years about now um, in my lab. And, and so we've applied those in a number of circumstances. Uh, you can use that approach to look for potentially uh, repurposing of medications to new therapies. Um, I gave you the example of looking at um, uh, using EHRs to look at hypothyroidism from my um, post back student uh, earlier, um, uh, diabetes. Uh, we have a huge study that's um, going to be coming out soon uh, looking at genome-wide association study with high blood pressure, um, uh, which actually for the first time uh, in this analysis and looking at um, uh, some approaches uh, pulls out alpha receptors, which are, you know, actually a, a, a common blood pressure um, medication target, but it's taken a huge cohort to actually find that with genetics, which just points out the, the value. We have about 2,000 loci that are associated with uh, high blood pressure uh, in this study, and it just points out the, um, uh, the need for huge studies sometimes to find actually very efficacious uh, medication targets. So, um, uh, and so uh, then the last thing I'll, I'll highlight is we, we, we're thinking a lot more about health disparities now that we have a good resource to do that. And so we're doing different ways of looking at the phenome and rare diseases um, like cystic fibrosis, um, uh, hereditary um, transthyretin uh, amyloidosis, which is, occurs in, um, uh, in, in people of African ancestry um, and uh, other conditions and looking at things like, you know, patients with cystic fibrosis, which is typically European ancestry, um, can be, uh, occur in everyone. And what we're finding is maybe you are more likely to have severe disease and be later diagnosed if you are African-American. Because, um, uh, so these are kind of health disparities that genomics can help us understand better and um, uh, maybe help us intervene on as we move towards a future of uh, health records integrated with more genetic records um, and uh, provide a better support, maybe close some of these gaps, more targeted therapies um, uh, in the future of, of our care for patients. So um, I really hope that my NHGRI Research Lab is, is, is leveraging all of us in a big way um, and other resources. And I hope that you know we're help, help to and tackle some of these questions that are so prevalent uh, for our country. Wow, this was fascinating and so exciting to learn about. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, I'd like to now ask my colleague, Sam, to join us with questions for the, from the audience. 
Excellent. Thank you, Sophia. And thank you, Dr. Denny. This has been an amazing conversation so far. What incredible work you're all doing at all of us right now. Um, so we have a couple of questions from the audience. I'm going to start uh, with a question about data sharing. This person is asking about um, access to data for, across the public and private ecosystem. What are your thoughts on expanding that access across, from, across the ecosystem? Yeah, so we are actively um, looking at it, continuing to expand access for researchers um, in many different classes. And so what we did intentionally with this program is started in a certain place and have continued to expand. So um, opening it up beyond our nonprofit healthcare and educational partners to include other types of researchers, um, such as in the commercial space, is something we're actually actively working on now and um, intend that uh, is something that we'll be um, hopefully able to uh, address soon. Excellent, excellent. So this question um, talks about data uh, saliva collection. You mentioned earlier that you're collecting saliva. Are you looking at both oral and systemic markers of health and disease in these samples as oral health is often left out of many of these programs? Oral health is a great call out and we are working with um, our partners, other institute and center partners here at the NIH to think about that as well. Um, at this point, our oral collections are focused on um, uh, genomics. So it's, it's actually a saliva kit for, uh, to set up for genome sequencing. Um, however, in Nutrition for Precision Health, they are um, collecting microbiome samples uh, as well. And so, uh, and we're also talking um, with uh, other institutes and centers about how maybe we could link in things like dental records. Um, and actually some of our partners uh, do have dental records. Uh, some of the FQHCs, for instance, um, have dental uh, uh, records and some of the uh, enrollment centers, the healthcare provider organizations also have dental records. So uh, we're looking at the electronic version of that. Um, and certainly we may also look at some sort of collection, biospecimen collection in the future. Excellent. All right, so um, another question we have here, you already touched on this a little bit, but how do you navigate returning results to historically marginalized groups like African-Americans? Certainly, uh, engagement begins really before they're part of the program, of course, and then uh, their communities and engagement partners, hopefully um, are partnering with them and, and have ongoing relationships with them as well. Uh, as you think about things like genomic return results, or you could imagine return results in other ways in the future, um, it is important that we have those sorts of connections with our participants. And so um, uh, we just have those relationships. It may be through a healthcare provider organization and that may be their main point of contact um, in which they actually would uh, see someone in the future and talk with them. Um, with the genomic counseling piece, um, you know, we have the same sort of support for all of our participants. And one of the things we really try to do is uh, really think through of all of our messaging, thinking through um, having it tested with diverse populations, get feedback. We've certainly made many revisions um, uh, of things and making sure we're sensitive to different communities and how they approach our data. And then uh, just being available um, in different ways to different people, um, I think is, is one of the things we can do. Um, I like to point out that our, you know, our genetic counselors are available really for any reason. People can come in and, and they can ask about um, their genetic ancestry if they want. They can ask bef questions before they decide to get a test. And then we really wanna educate people before they decide to get in a result. So a health-related result could have indicated, it doesn't, um, because of uh, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, um, GINA, uh, it won't impact your ability to get health insurance, but it could impact some other kinds of insurance. And so we educate on the potentials for this kind of information ahead of time um, and uh, you know, really are there to try to help them understand any potential risks of getting that kind of information as well. And I think this is an evolving story because these kinds of data are very new. Um, and so we continue to work with people as we do things uh, over time. Excellent. So um, speaking of participants, are you still recruiting for the All of Us Research Program? And if so, how does one register to participate? Ah, uh, great. I love that question. Yes, we are. We uh, we need, uh, you know, there's no ceiling. We say at least a million, uh, you know, five million is fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, we'll, we'll figure out a way to, uh, I know, to fund more of that. Joinallofus.org uh, is the URL um, uh, all, you know, together. And um, we would uh, love to have as many people join as possible. Excellent. Excellent. 
All right, so back to oral health. Um, this person says, my team is using all of this data to study oral health. There are very few oral health questions in the personal medical history and, my, and little dental info in the electronic health records. Would you consider recruiting participants from dental, from dental offices to get more dental offices? That is a fascinating proposal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Short answer, yes. <laughs> um, I, you know, I would love to see a proposal in that space uh, with the ability to share dental records um, because we are building out other ways to try to capture electronic medical records. Um, there's no reason why we wouldn't consider that. Um, and uh, it's driven largely by um, the, of course, proposals that we get in. Um, and there's no reason why we wouldn't support, uh, consider supporting, obviously through a competitive process, such a, a recruitment mechanism. All right, next question we have here. Are you planning to share some of these samples with other investigators under an IRB protocol, not just the data? Um, sorry, I missed part of that. <laughs> are you planning to share some of these samples with other investigators under an IRB <sighs> protocol, not just the data? Yes, yes, we will. Uh, uh, bio samples are stored um, internally. Um, new projects coming in to use those would go through an application process and embedding. It's a precious sample, of course, um, that we have. And so based on that process, we would allow uh, those samples to be used for other projects. Uh, they may, depending on the project, it may or may not actually even require a new IRB. It certainly would require a project level review. We are starting those kinds of studies, which we call ancillary studies, uh, as um, uh, through institutes and centers at the NIH, the plan eventually is um, to make that kind of application process more broadly open. Um, and uh, we can also imagine that we would have some public-private partnerships that could um, participate and help um, fund uh, kind of biospecimen-based research as well. Excellent. So uh, our next question, long COVID and related ME slash CH CFAs. CFS, sorry, affect millions and key symptoms in PME post ex, extra run, <laughs> PME. Can you add, would you be willing, would you be open to adding questions to new patient enrollment, to new patient enrollment to document PME since fatigue is alone is much too vague? Did that, did I mess that completely? Yeah, I, I understand where the question's headed. Okay. Um, and it actually could correspond even to another aspect of the oral uh, history question uh, that was asked before. Uh, you know, we are an ongoing relationship with our participants and we actually release new surveys to people. So, uh, you know, we try to balance like what that initial survey is um, uh, out there time-wise to kind of get them through key parts of the interview um, and biospecimen collection uh, for a certain amount of time in that initial visit. And then we do update uh, questionnaires. We probably don't really, um, if you think about comparability over time with a, a survey and statistical uh, and, and um, survey-based rigor, uh, we, we want to change the initial as little as possible. Um, and then, but opening to new surveys um, is something we're certainly uh, very eager to. We actually have a, a roadmap of lots of questions um, that we uh, intend to produce and release to our participants over time. Excellent. So we're coming out of time, but I do think we have time for one more question from our audience. Thank you to our audience for all of your wonderful questions. Um, do you know if the pharmacogenomic test results uh, at the All of Us Research Program are being used by clinicians to inform healthcare? What does that look like on the other end? At this point, I don't really know yet how these test results are being used. Uh, it is a really important part of our uh, mission to figure that out and to do follow up with participants to see how clinicians in the field are using these kinds of results um, to change care uh, interventions, uh, enhance screening, uh, different medications, whatever the whatever the outcome might be, depending on the you know the drug. Um, uh, genome interaction or genetic variant that you might have. So um, uh, certainly that's a question I really look forward to hearing, seeing the answer to. I just don't know it yet. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm going to throw it back to Sophia. Thank you again, Dr. Denny. It has been so wonderful to hear from you today. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Denny, for joining us today. Um, so well, everyone, it looks like that's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you to the audience for your thoughts and for your participation. Um, before you go, please take a look at the link in the chat. I'd like to invite you to register for our next Special Alliance discussion on Wednesday, March 6th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. 
featuring Mary Woolley, President and CEO of Research America. Mary will share newly released data from a national omnibus survey uh, commissioned in January of 2024 by Research America on topics like support for federally funded research, trust in science, global competitiveness, and more. Um, following it, an overview of our survey results, we'll be joined by my colleagues, Aaron Brown and Jenny LaRae for a fireside chat on the results and their impact. Thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great afternoon.